First of all, I want to thank the organizer for the possibility to present this result with, uh, with a joint project with uh, Su Zaobin and Yulu, and uh, with uh, many other collaborators, among which I want to mention Jörg uh, Frelich, uh, with, which, with whom uh, I start to develop some of the mathematical ideas behind this approach. Yefe, uh, which is in Shenzhen, uh, with, with whom uh, we uh, develop this uh, mechanism of superconductivity, and begin with, uh, which is now in BIN, uh, which do, did the calculation uh, on the superfluid density. So the plan of the talk is the following. I first present the key idea of uh, a new proposal uh, for a mechanism of charge pairing in the cuprate. Then I show how I implement this idea in the TJ model for whole dope cuprates. And then I outline some uh, of how the emerging non-BCS mechanism for superconductivity and uh, the proposal of explanation of some experimental features, in particular of superfluid density. Uh, it is uh, commonly believed that antiferromagnetism is a key ingredient for superconductivity in cuprates, and then of course, a natural pairing glue would be the spin fluctuation, the spin waves. Of course, their action would be enhanced by a detail of the Fermi surface, like nesting, but the evidence for this is not so clear. Here we propose a pairing glue, uh, as a pairing glue and another excitation, still emerging from antiferromagnetism, but purely of quantum origin. The, the, we can call uh, antiferromagnetic vortices. Let me try to explain the idea. In antiferromagnetic, the spin group SU2 is broken to U1. And the quotient SU2 over U1 is uh, isomorphic to the two sphere. And uh, the point of the two sphere labels the direction from the spin. And the fluctuation of this uh, direction are described by spin waves. Then there is a uh, left and uh, U1, which is unbroken, and usually is uh, typically ju just described by um, physical gauge fluctuation, pure gauge. But in 2D, one can consider also vortices of a Haranoff bomb type in this U1. It's still due to antiferromagnetism, and uh, because of antiferromagnetism, uh, they, these vortices they will have opposite chirality in the two nail sublattices. Now imagine that we lower the temperature, then we have a gas of vortices with opposite chirality in the two sublattices. They undergo a chirality-like transition with the formation of a finite density of vortex pair of opposite chirality. And now imagine that these vortices are centered on charge. Then this uh, binding of, of vortex and anti-vortex pairs will induce a new form of charge pairing. It's still due to antiferromagnetism, but of course it's different from spin fluctuation pairing. Now let me show how this idea, general idea, is implemented and can be implemented in the group weights. So let's start from uh, the usual picture. We have. Uh, the d orbitals of the copper and the p orbitals of the oxygen. When we introduce a doping, a whole doping in the parent compound, it will combine with a single spin of the copper site, hybridizing in the hybridized p orbitals, forming a spin singlet. This is so-called zank rice singlet. Now I want to describe the low energy physics of this system. We can see the zhang rice singlet as an empty site in the two-dimensional TJ model uh, based on the copper sites. So the TJ model is made by uh, one hopping term, which describes the possibility of this singlet to hop, because they have uh, one oxygen orbital in common with the next uh, uh, copper uh, um, site. Then you have the antiferromagnetic term, which is described antiferromagnetism at low temperature of the parent compound. And because of this structure, we also have the so-called Gatzweiler projection, which eliminates a double occupation. So this is the one which describes, the, so to say, the MOT physics at, uh, <coughs> for, very, for small doping. 
Now, in our approach, the MOT physics is stacked with the uh, spin charge decomposition of the O. So we write the hole, which describes the Kreisinger singles in terms of a hollow, which is a spinless fermion. And then, by the Pauli principle, automatically take into account no double occupation constraint. As we will see, we need some dressing of this simple spinless fermion. And uh, so the, the hollow, which is charged, and the spinons, which is which has a spin one half, it is a, a spin one half boson, plus as we see, we we'll see a dressing. What is this dressing? The, we can learn this dressing starting from the one-dimensional TJ model. In the one-dimensional TJ model, if we put if we put an empty site, uh, the empty site is uh, here. I have nearby spin are uh, in the same orientation, but this excitation can be. Uh, split in two different pieces. One is just uh, uh, what is called a spinon, which is a mismatch of a spin one half corresponding to this side, plus a string of spin flipped until a, an empty side in which, however, the neighboring side have antiferromagnetic uh, uh, spin orientation. So now, in this, so this, the spinon is the, the simplest description would be just this spin mismatch plus the empty side. But as you see, here you get a string of spin flip. And now it turns out that if you interchange the spin on fields due to this spin string, one gets a phase factor which is plus or minus high. Hence the spin on therefore is a semion. So it is a, a excitation which has a braid statistics one half. So when you interchange two, you just get this phase factor. And uh, uh, which is intermediate, exactly intermediate between the boson and the fermion. Naively, one can describe the holon as uh, a spinless fermion, but we know that the hole is uh, still a fermion. And so we need to add to the spinless fermion H a charge string, and this turn it, it into a semion too. So combining together the two strings, you get back a fermion as you want for the whole. However, the charge string has an additional effect. It modifies the Aldean occupation statistics of the holons from parameter one to parameter one half, so that the maximum occupation at fixed number is two. And the Fermi momenta of the spinless semionic holon is the same of the Fermi momenta of a spin one half fermion. Therefore, the spin on, since the spin on has no chemical potential, the composite hole satisfies still the Lattinger theorem. So this is the way in which, in one dimension, one realizes the key excitation. Now this, you, this suggests to proceed in the same way in two dimension. But if we naively export the string picture from one dimension to two dimension, we see the appearance of a confining gauge strings between the hollow and the spin on. Because you see, uh, you have now, in, we are in two dimension. Now there is a mismatch along the string which propagates all the way around. And this implies that uh, you have a confining potential, as a gauge string, a confining potential. Which, uh, uh, of course, mathematically comes just from the decomposition of the hole. The hole is split into a hole. On, and a spin on, but if you multiply the all on field by a phase and the spin on phase by the same phase, you get the same hole. So you have a uh, local U1 slave particle gauge symmetry. And this, is this, this effect is just described by a gauge field, so this gauge string. However, the point is that the charge and the spin strings which appear in one dimension are topologically described by kinks. But the two-dimensional analog of a kink is a vortex. And because it costs much less energy in two dimensions than a kink. So it is more natural to look for vortices in the two-dimensional TJ model, how, you can, how these vortices appear. You can prove that you can add a charge flux to the spinless fermion and a spin flux to the spin one half Bose field such that the gradient of this flux is the potential of a vortex, a vortex, which is similar to the Laughlin vortices in the fractional quantum hole effect. 
What is the effect of this charge flux and the spin flux? This modifies the statistics of the holon and the spinon and convert again them into a semion says in 1D. St uh, but still, if the original uh, hole which describes the, the right triangle right singlet is equal to so holon times this flux, charge flux, spinons times this spin flux, which are written here. These two fluxes can be introduced via coupling with a chern simons gauge field in the Lagrangian. They don't modify the dynamics because the chern simons field do not modify the dynamics. It modifies the statistics, but the point is that the statistics change which is introduced by the Yuan group is exactly cancelled by the statistics change induced by this SU2 spin group. So this is, if you use this representation, keeping this constraint uh, fixed, you really get the uh, exact rewriting. We proved that this is an exact rewriting of the TJ model. Now you, do a, now you start to do approximation. You do a mean field in which you neglect the spin, spin on fluctuation in the spin flux. Then the spin of, it becomes very simple like this, and then it is clear what is the meaning of this spin flux. You just attach a U1 spin vortex at the Holland position, because this is a Holland position, with the opposite chirality in the two nail sublattices. This is due to the fact that if you go back here, originally you have, uh, this is, uh, you have the spin uh, on, one, on, the right, on the side, but because of anti ferromagnetic you get that this is basically concentrated in plus and minus uh, one in the z, let's say, in the direction of the magnetization. Now, as you see, these vortices are in the U1, which is complementary to the SU2 or spin direction. You see, you do not, this is always along the z direction. You do not, it's not, it's not a spin vortex in the sense that the spin direction moves in a vortex-like fashion, but it's like in the of bohm effect. It is a, a inside this strange U1, which is left unbroken by the uh, antiferromagnetic uh, transition. So this both is uh, the U1, which is complementary to the SU2 of the spin direction. And so it's a purely of quantum origin, because if you classically, you only see this, SU, uh, this, this S2. You don't see this uh, uh, U1. So it's purely of quantum origin, exactly like the Harron of Bohm effect. And these are exactly the chiral vortices which advocated in the introduction. They do not modify the antiferromagnetic background, so they cost much less than a string. And uh, it, the effect is that the gauge field, the, the slave particle gauge field, is not anymore confining, but it's only binding at low energy. So it binds together the spinon and the holon, but only at low energy. So, so the chirality of the spin vortices is a key factor for the pairing, and it's due to antiferromagnetism. And uh, however, again, as in one dimension, you need a charge vortex, so, and then again, you get the same effect. The Fermi surface of semionic spinless holons is equal to the Fermi surface of spin one half fermion. So you get the original tight binding Fermi surface as a starting point. We have, we have uh, it's not yet published, but we have uh, working out a proof, a rigorous proof of this. But this is assumed later. So we can now rewrite the TJ Hamiltonian in terms of this uh, description. You have a, a hopping term, and you have a, 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 the J term split in terms which, which depend on the spin flux. And you have a, a, the quartic term in the terms of Hollands. And uh, <coughs> it is interesting that because of this rewriting, you see the uh, the best possible uh, solution would be that the hopping, this term here, has a modulus equal to one, because of this, this minus sign. This uh, you would like to have again one to optimize, uh, and here again you want to have one. Uh, so uh, you have to have one, and here you want to have zero, because of the, of the uh, positive sign. So it turns out that you have an identity that uh, if you this identity, the sum, this square plus this square is equal to one. 
So if you impose that the modulus of this term here is equal to 1, automatically this is 0. And so you optimize both the t term and the j term simultaneously. And you have this possibility only due to the, to the fact that you have introduced this SU2 flexibility. Introducing a Chern-Simon firm introduces a kind of flexibility. Because, of course, at level of mean field, at level of rigor, uh, without any mean field approximation, it is always the same. You rewrite the TJ model in many equivalent way. The point is that when you start to do mean field approximation, this equivalence of all the way in which you rewrite the TJ model breaks down. And now this way here has the flexibility of optimizing this uh, constraint. And so the uh, energy is less, is, is, the, is the best. Is this is, is basically the same argument to work in one dimension. So the, so the, the semionic nature of the, of the excitation in one dimension is crucial, as has been proved by Aldane, to the uh, solution of the model in one dimension. And here we try to mimic the same structure in two dimensions. Now, there is a strange thing, which is an interaction term between the spinons and the spin, the spin flux. As you will see, this term here is both origin of short range anti-ferromagnetic and of the pairing attraction. Just to summarize, this, this term in the hopping generates, this, let's consider the low energy continuum limit. This term in the hopping generates a, a minimal coupling of holons to the slave particle gauge field, which is written in terms of the spin in this way. The second term generates uh, uh, a O3 Eisenberg mold that describes the undoped group weight with a renormalized coupling due to the presence of the holons. And the third term, it turned out to be a repulsive term for the spinons because of positive sign. And introducing a Hubbard straton of each field, we can treat in mean field the holons and generate a spinon pairing term, like in, its, in the kind of BCS like treatment. Now, the interaction between vortices and spinons, this term here, if you now average the flux, automatically you get a, a gap for the spinons. So it turned out that the gapless spinons, which describe the spin waves of the Heisenberg model, traveling in this gas of spin vortices, which are centered on holons, acquire a gap. And this gap is proportional to the square root of delta log of delta. So this is a transition from a long range antiferromagnetism of the undoped parent compound to a short range antiferromagnetism of the doped system. And the dependence of the doping is in agreement with uh, experiment on antiferromagnetic uh, anti anti correlation lengths. But the same term, now you do a different. You, instead of averaging this, you average the, the term with a spin on. It turns out that the result is just a two-dimensional Coulomb interaction between holons in different nails sublattice, which is due to the original KT interaction between the spin vortices. So the original, you have these vortices. They have an interaction. But because uh, this generates a Coulomb attraction between holons, because all the vortices are centered on, 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 on holons, which correspond to the, remember, correspond to the description of Zangrai singlet in the end. Now, because of this two-dimensional Coulomb attraction, at uh, the cost of its temperature, which we call uh, T pairing of holon, TPH, you have the formation of incoherent holon pairs. Of course, they have a D-wave-like structure, because it is clear from this way here that the nearest neighbor have the strongest attraction uh, in, in, in this case. And you can salt, find the, this temperature, this cost of the uh, like temperature by solving a kind of BCS gap equation. However, I mean, the hole is not made only of charge. It's, only ma it's also made of spin. To get the Cooper pair, you, you need a spin pairing. What happens is that it is the gauge. 
the gauge attraction between the spin and the charge using the hall pair as a source of effective spin attraction induce a formation of incoherent spin singlet resonance valence bond spin pair at a lower temperature, which I call a TPS pairing of spinons. And the, to find this temperature, you just solve the analog of the kind of BCS-like equation for the spin order parameter. Why you get this uh, spin pairing? The spin pairing is favorable because it lowers the spin on gap. Why? Why? Because if you have a, a vortex anti vortex pair which is very close, they form a dipole. The dipole do not screen. But the screening is exactly the gap of the, of the spin on. So, so lowering the gap of the spin on, you gain energy. And so it is favorable at lower temperature to find a really a uh, spin pair formation. It's a temperature which is lower than the temperature of, of spin pairing. The effective action you can opt obtain just by integrating out the massive spinons. What is the result? Is a gauge three-dimensional XY model with angle field, which is just a phase of the whole pair field. So you have Holland, you have the spinons, the RVB spinons, and the, fa the, the, the uh, phase coming from the spin, uh, <coughs> spin vortices, so to say. What is uh, the, this, uh, the gradient of this phase is just uh, the potential of the abricot of standard magnetic vortices. So this is uh, the, the usual vortices, not the one, the one we have discussed until now. So then the Lagrange is just the usual uh, XY model coupled with the gauge field. <coughs> this model is three-dimensional because the, the spin on dispersion is relativistic. And it treats spin, the space, and time on the same footing, and the temperature is much smaller than the energy scale, which is set by J. Now below uh, this temperature in which you pair the spin on, the spin you have both incoherent pair of pinon and incoherent pair of holon. So now we have an incoherent composite whole pair. Now when this, now you have this uh, preformed, so to say, pair. When this preformed pair, whole pair condenses, you finally get the superconductivity. So basically, the diagram which we get in the, uh, from uh, numerically from uh, is of this form, and you have to be compared with, uh, with this is the line which you find as a function of temperature and doping for the formation of the whole pair, which is more or less uh, qualitatively agree with the T star, experimental T star. Then you have a line which corresponds to the pair formation of spin pair, which more or less agree with uh, this line, which is the line below which we find the NERN signal in the, in the group weight, and then you have superconductivity. So this is basically this three-step mechanism of superconductivity. So TC is at, uh, smaller than uh, the, the formation, the temperature of a spin pair formation. So the low energy description is that of the gauge XY model. Then the superconducting transition is just a superconducting transition of the 3D gauge XY model. At the critical test, you see the gauge field is gapped by Anderson Higgs mechanism, and the gauge fluctuations are suppressed, so it's basically close to the superconducting transition of the classical three dimensional XY model. The uh, superconducting uh, scale is set by spin on pair condensation because if you if you go back you see that originally you have uh, the, the the only when the spin pair condense the you get the all pair condensation so the sorry uh, so the why, why you get this? You get, get a gain in kinetic energy by lowering the spin on gap. But then, since the TC is set, is is set by spin on pair condensation, it is insensitive to the Fermi surface detail, which are recorded by the Hornos. Are the Hornos which have a Fermi surface? So, for example, like nesting, or it's completely irrelevant. So, this 
in this uh, approach explain the stability of the phase guy, a diagram of the coup rates, so the universality of the phase diagram. Because it's not due to detail of the Fermi surface of the uh, charge carrier, but actually is basically dominated by the spin carrier, which are very universally independent of any detail of the Fermi surface. Uh, just a flash on two uh, property uh, in between the, the, in the region in between. When the temperature is between the critical, the superconducting temperature and the formation of the uh, charge pairing, the scattering of the phase of the Ollon pair field on Ollon destroys the coherence locally on the Fermi surface starting from the antinodal region. And then this reproduces the Fermi arcs phenomenology. Just to show that is, this is, can be really reproduced, this is the, uh, this calculation in our model compared with one uh, experiment, uh, uh, one experimental data in BISCO. So you really see that uh, the <coughs> scattering of this Holland pair gradually from the, in this angle, this is in the nodal direction, but gradually, 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 as you move towards the antenodal, develop this. Uh, uh, <coughs> <Yep. coughs> as in, in the experiment. In the region between instead the uh, superconducting transition and the formation of the spin pair, then you have still incoherent composite all pair, and they support magnetic vortices. And because of the existence of the magnetic vortices, they support enhanced signal. Just to show that the qualitatively you get some agreement with the experiment, this is the plot of the uh, spin and pair density in, in, uh, in our approach compared with uh, the, the enhanced data in, in LASCO. And the qualitatively, again, we, we find some kind of agreement. Let me just come to the application of the superfluid density. Let me stress that the normalized superfluid density, so this is OS, is a, uh, superfluid density as a function of T over Tc quotient by the uh, superfluid density at zero temperature, it turned out that from moderate under doping to almost optimal doping exhibit a non-BCS universality with independence both on doping and on the specific kind of material. These are data from many different materials, many different dopings, and you see when you plot this function, they all fall in the same curve. I, this here, there is no fitting. This is just uh, experimental data. And if you look what is the critical exponent of this for the same materials, you find that the two thirds is the critical exponent. So this two thirds is actually definitely non-BCS. And another three, and in fact, is typical of a exponent of three-dimensional XY model. And another typical feature of this uh, superfluid density is the Wemura relation. Approximately, the superfluid density at zero temperature is proportional to the superconducting temperature. Let's show that this approach can explain this fact. I mean, the basically, the universality of the superfluid density is again due to this composite structure because Okay, the Ollon contribution is a standard D wave. The spin on contribution is the one of the 3D XY model. So basically the contribution of the spin on at zero, the, at zero temperature is just, uh, you see this, you can see this coefficient uh, basically as the inverse effective temperature. And so the superfluid density at zero temperature is basically the derivative of this coefficient calculated uh, at uh, inver the, derivative, the inverse of this derivative calculated at zero temperature. And the superfluid density, the contribution of the spin is just proportional to the superfluid density at zero temperature times the superfluid, the normalized the superfluid density of the XY model. Now, the superfluid density depends on spin and holons by themselves, not on the all as a whole. Why? Because of the, the, the superfluid density is just basically the polarization bubble at zero uh, momentum and uh, frequency. 
The electromagnetic field is coupled to the ohlom because it is charged, but the same particle gauge field is coupled both to ohlom and spinons. Then you automatically, by gauge invariance, you get an addition rule of type that uh, the uh, two polarization are in parallel. And this, it turned out that of give uh, the same composition rule for the superfluid density, the so-called Joffel-Arkin addition rule. Now it turned out that in the underdope region, the spinons dominate. And uh, uh, since the low energy spinon action is the one which triggers the superconducting transition, you get the exponent of the three-dimensional XY model. So two-thirds, which agree with the experiment. The spinon contribution, the fact that the spinon contribution is dominating, plus the fact that the ratio of the effective temperature, theta of T over theta of Tc, is basically is, is, uh, proportional to T over Tc, implies that the superfluid density in the entire temperature range, so it uh, agree with the 3D XY-like. So completely non-BCS behavior in, in this respect. Furthermore, the if you notice that the uh, effective temperature at zero temperature is zero, you can expand. And, and the superfluid density at zero temperature is the inverse derivative at zero temperature of the effective temperature. You can expand the effective temperature at the critical temperature, which is a constant in around the Tc. So you get derivative of Dc to the T at zero times Tc. So this is just this. Uh, ratio, and this ratio is basically constant. This is the Wemura relation. So if we, with have only one parameter, the other are all fixed by requirement on the phase diagram. But one, with only one parameter weighting the relative spin on all on contribution, we get the basically perfect fit of the experimental data in all the uh, temperature range from zero to the critical temperature. This, this, these are the data, and the black line is the fit with one value of R of uh, the superfluid density in our approach. So let me summarize. So this is a, a mechanism of superconductivity which is based on vortices. The approach is based on a composite nature of the Zangerai's singlet, and the motness character of this Zangerai's singlet is described by splitting of these uh, holes in terms of hollow spinons at the binding gauge. And the Fermi surface is inherited from semionic hollows. It's semionic to preserve the Fermi surface and in analogy to one dimension. The superconductivity is realized with a three-step scenario. First, the holons are the center of vortex quantum distortion of the antiferromagnetic background, which is the new, really completely new feature, in my opinion, of this approach, because they are in the quantum U1 of the decomposition of the SU2 of spin. Then these vortex interact KT-like, and then there is a, 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 some temperature at, at because of the southwest transition temperature, there is a finite density of Holon pairs. Because of the gauge attraction between Holon and Spino at the even low, at lower temperature, which I call formation, there is a formation of the density of resonance valence bond spin on pairs, and then you get preformed all pairs. Finally, the third temperature is the superconducting temperature where you have the condensation of Holland pairs giving rise to superconductivity. Thank you. Uh, take for open question. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe I just missed it. So, uh, this uh, Chern Simon's term. Yes. Uh, okay, did you add it? because it doesn't like okay violate the symmetry or it appeared naturally no uh, it, 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 or, or uh, it was derived from uh, something okay. i probably missed it uh, no so that turns same we you start from the tj model you couple uh, the 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 with this uh, trans simon test so you add this term okay 
U1 cross SU2. <laughs> then you can prove that uh, this new, formally new uh, model is exactly equivalent to the original TJ model. This you can mathematically prove. Oh. Then you, you, you use this additional freedom that you have in fact introducing uh, using this U1 and SU2 to handle, to better optimize the mean field of this TJ model. Thanks. So I'm not sure I understood exactly, you know, where the trick is. So um, in your model, I mean, in principle, the original model is a TJ model, and then basically you start changing the representation, and you argue yeah. that essentially the relevant degrees of freedom are these kind of vortices. Yes. Now, but something that is, you know, um, that is of extreme importance is the resonance peak. For example, the observation of resonance peak uh, in, uh, in the cuprates. Okay. You mean in, in the magnetic, uh, the magnetic uh, neutron scattering, in elastic neutron, neutron scattering. Yeah. So uh, the thing that is not clear to me, because you know the picture I have of the TJ model is when I start putting. I mean, it's true that if you put one, there is a problem, but you put two, and they like to form stripes. So you replace the stripes by these vortices. Yeah. But um, you know, I mean, if you do simulations, you see this type of stripy correlations, and you see resonance peak. So my question to you is, if you are trying to uh, basically look at uh, 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 the magnetic structure factor, for example, are you going to see the resonance yeah. peak or yes. not within this picture? Yes, we we did see this this this. Uh, this is basically due to the fact that. Uh, um, the, when you have the, uh, the spin-on pair formation, the spin-on pair formation uh, lower the, 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 the spin-on gap in a way which is, uh, uh, which is due to the, which in the, in the following way. You, it's basically the original spin-on dispersion gets split in two branches. One is lower than the other one. Why? Because uh, when you have the spin pair formation, the um, you have two excitation which have the same quantum number. With one is you, when you add a spin, a spin on, in this gas of uh, spin on pairs, it has a higher energy. However, if you destroy a spin on in a spin on pair, it has a lower energy than the original one. So you get a kind of uh, um, uh, hourglass dispersion. Oh, so you get the yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we see this. How we, we, this we, we really did it. So, but what, what is? But what is given basically the pitch of that thing? What sets the scale? I mean, it's basically density. Uh, sorry. What sets the scale? I mean, of this particular resonance. The, this this is resonance is at the antiferromagnetic, in, in, in this approach, in this re it, it is really the at the antiferromagnetic wave vector, the resonance, the the the. the, the, the then it, it, they have two branches which go one above and, and, and another below. And uh, yeah, but is density what gives this scale? I mean, this hourglass yes, yes. should be density. Yeah, yeah, it, it, is, it, it is in the, in the um, magnon correla correlator. It's a collective magnon. Collective magnon excitation. So th in this case, we, we interpret this not in the stripey way, so to say, but uh, through, this, uh, through this mechanism. I do not claim, of course, that this is a, an explanation of everything. I think many things are missing here. For example, the charge order, the, but I think this is due to the, uh, in my opinion at least, it's due to oxygen, uh, to, to other features which are not kept track directly by this uh, TJ, TJ approach. For instance, to reproduce something realistic, maybe you, you need probably to add more and more features. But this seems to be very universal, so to say, it seems to me. The, uh, we have, uh, for example, the, the crossover structure of the phase drama, we are really able to reproduce uh, nicely in the respect, uh, so we find some uh, crossover line below which you have the nest effect, we find a line which uh, corresponds to a change in the shape, basically, of the Fermi surface. Uh, 
which uh, uh, correspond to the formation of this arc. And uh, so I think the, 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 this part here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's reproduced. The other feature, maybe not. A few years ago, I remember reading a paper, an experimental paper, uh, which uh, claimed to infer uh, evidence for uh, skirmions in doped antiferromagnets with uh, what seems like a very similar uh, mechanism to what you've outlined, just outlined to us now in much more detail. Uh, do you see any uh, possibility within your work for a, a non-zero topological charge in these vortices? So do you think there might be skirmions rather than vortices causing the coupling? Mm, I, I think uh, we, we do not see this, this uh, because skirmion, I imagine, it corresponds to a, a, a rotation of the uh, di spin direction, if I understand correctly. But the point here is that these vortices have a nice feature that on one side, they are vortices, and so they have all these nice features. On the other side, they do not disturb too much the antiferromagnetic background because they are in the U1, which is not involved in the spin direction. So that's the reason why I think they are the good excitation. Because you see, the string in one dimension flip the spin, and this is fine. In one dimension, it's fine because they do not cost too much energy. But in two dimensions, it wouldn't work. Anything which modifies the, the antiferromagnetic background is not very good. So this is, in some sense, antiferromagnetic origin, but yet do not modify the antiferromagnetic background, basically. 